So now that we've figured out what species are and how to define them, and what then keeps species apart, let's figure out how these branching or non-branching patterns of ev evolution actually produce species out in nature. And so let's investigate the mechanisms of speciation. Even though there are uh, some very min minor differences in multiple ways by which you can define speciation, there are really two main modes of speciation. And these are called allopatric and sympatric. Allo means other. And patric, if you think of somebody who is a patriot, they are involved in the uh, support of their country. So allopatric, maybe you can call, if you think of as other country. And sim means same. And then, of course, country would be the same. So other country speciation or same country speciation, I think that tells you pretty much what's going to happen here. Allopatric speciation means that somehow from a time where the entire population is in the same place, you get to a new time where the population is in two places, as shown here by perhaps a mountain chain. Another way you could do this, you can express this as here you have your original population and then you have an island. So that could also be the other country aspect. So different islands, different places on either side of perhaps a, a canyon, perhaps a lava flow, whatever it is, there's going to be some geographic barrier. So allopatric speciation requires some kind of barrier. Sympatric species, whoops, sympatric species, on the other hand, has no barrier. In sympatric speciation, somehow, as you can see here, these lighter colored green trees somehow speciated from within the group of darker colored trees. No explanation, it just sort of happened. So that's obviously an odd one. I think this one, allopatric speciation, that's intuitive. It's intuitive because of what we just talked about with respect to uh, diversifying selection, right? Disruptive selection. You go from one place and you, you end up with two things, or directional selection. You start with one thing and turn it into another. In either case, allopatric speciation makes sense. Sympatric speciation, where you suddenly have a new thing seemingly out of nowhere, is a little bit harder to deal with. So let's take a look and see how these work. Allopatric speciation means that there is some kind of geographic isolation. And because there is geographic isolation, it cuts off any kind of genetic connection between the two populations. So there is no gene flow anymore. These two populations have somehow separated. Now the example here is two types of of antelope squirrels, one from the north rim of the Grand Canyon and one from the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And so obviously the Grand Canyon is a pretty formidable barrier and a squirrel, a little squirrel like this, from the north rim isn't going to say one day, one fine bright morning, I'm going to go visit the folks in the south. It's going to run all the way down the steep canyon, cross the raging river, and it's going to go all the way back on the other side, only to be back for dinner after a little hanky-panky. That's just not going to happen. And so they are isolated, even though they can see each other from one rim to the next, but they're isolated. Now, what does this really mean in terms of isolation? Well, if you think about what the weather is like on the north part of the Grand Canyon, you have to recognize that the north part of the Grand Canyon is about 400 feet higher in elevation than the south rim. So that makes a slight difference in temperature. It's also uh, with a lot more trees. It's a better forested area of the Grand Canyon. It's a little bit more deserty to the south. And so there are a variety of subtle climate changes between the north and the south. 
And since all organisms are ultimately a product of their environment, it stands to reason that natural selection would deal with both of these populations slightly differently. So in this case, you would have the northern population develop into something that's a little bit different over time than the southern population. So there are going to be shifts in allele frequencies over time. They're going to muta be mutations that happen in the north and not in the south. They're going to be genetic features that are going to be selected for in the north but selected against in the south and so on and so forth. And so over time you can end up with two distinct forms. In this case you have Harris's antelope squirrel in the south and the white-tailed antelope squirrel in the north. If you look at this in a schematic it's pretty clear why this happens and how it happens. So in each case here, we see that there is a time, time scale, and on this part, at this time in the time scale, the populations become divided. And at this point in time, they become sympatric again. So somehow they, they merge, they get back together. Well, if, based on the biological species concept, they are able to interbreed when they get back together, then that means there was no speciation. But if at that point they can no longer interbreed, then speciation is said to have occurred. So this is one instance where you can have two populations that are very similar, but they are now different. And here is an example where you have A and A, but also B. So this would be an example of this branching evolution. Now it may be that in this case you have A and A in which case there clearly was no speciation at all but it may also be possible that you have A and then B in both cases there was speciation and so this could be an example for having perhaps non-branching evolution. So there's all kinds of scenarios you can come up with. Notice here the time scale does not have any numbers on it in terms of years. And that's because we don't really want to measure things in years. We want to measure things in generation time. The reason why generation time is that's when genetic changes can accrue from one generation to the next. And in us, generation time is perhaps 20 years. Some would say 30 years. Whereas in insect populations, it's probably less than a year. In bacterial populations, it could be every 20 minutes. And so you end up with an undefined time scale depending on what organism you're looking at. Now let's turn for a minute to sympatric speciation. Sympatric speciation was this fairly enigmatic way of forming species where you end up with a new form arising from within an existing form. How does something like that happen? Clearly, if it happens from one generation to the next or in the same area, there's very little for natural selection to do because the environment is going to be the same. I mean, both of these new species exist in the same environment. So how could this actually happen? And it turns out that sympatric speciation is due to mutation. And the mutation literally, in an instant, from one generation to the next, builds that barrier between parents and offspring. So one of those barriers that we talked about, the prezygotic barriers, perhaps even the postzygotic barrier, is established from one generation to the next. So that's obviously very rapid. The reason why this can happen is because of mistakes in chromosome number. Now if you think back to when we discussed chromosomes and how you can sometimes have an extra little chromosome and it already makes some changes to your phenotype. Well, what if you actually had an entirely different chromosome set than your parents? Well, that would obviously make you genetically different because you have all this extra information. It doesn't happen in all kinds of organisms. It happens in certain organisms more frequently than in others. And where it happens most frequently and not only once but all the time is in plants. And this phenomenon is called polyploidy. Remember the terms diploid and 
haploid. Diploid means you have a ploidy of two. Haploid means you have a ploidy of one. Polyploidy means you have some other kind of ploidy. Maybe two sets of chromosomes. So instead of having 2n, you could have 4n. And in that case, you would call that a polyploid because you have multiples, right? So that is one mechanism for sympatric speciation. And the gentleman who recognized this is pictured here. His name is Hugo de Vries, who was also one of the people who rediscovered Mendelian genetics. So this guy was very influential, first of all because of his contribu contribution to Mendelian genetics, but also of his experiments in primroses. And one of the things he did is, after realizing how Mendelian genetics work, he created his own set of experiments using this particular type of plant, these primroses, and he reconstructed some of Mendel's work. And that was one of the things people did at the time. They used all kinds of other organisms, other than peas, to redo Mendel's experiments. And he was working with these evening primrose plants, and he recognized that there are, within his experimental plants, two distinct plants, two distinct form forms. This one, called uh, Lamarckiana, was a relatively small one. And then he had this one he called Gigas, for giant, because it was large. And it had all kinds of large features. It had larger flowers, it had larger buds, it had larger seed pods, it had all kinds of things that were just bigger. And he realized after a while that this was not something that happened only once, and it was some kind of weird thing, but it happened multiple times in his plants, and so obviously these primroses somehow do this kind of thing. They somehow make these mistakes. And so even though these were called two distinct species, they would re-speciate periodically when these errors that led to polyploidy were being made by the plants. How does this work? Well, these are errors again similar to some of the errors we talked about earlier. We talked about non-disjunction. Remember that? Non-disjunction was what created an extra chromosome set. Well, this is sort of the same way it can happen here because the chromosomes fail to separate and then the error becomes perpetuated. And so here's how that works. In this case, we're looking at two species and these are full-on nice species but obviously species that are able to somehow interbreed. And so here you have species A and species B. They have two different sets of chromosomes, not that different, but a little bit different. And then they produce, normally produce these gametes. And if fertilization occurs with these gametes, then you would say, okay, well, we have this error in the chromosome number, right? And this is basically what we saw with non-disjunction. There was an extra chromosome here. But now this is not within one organism. This is not within one species. These are two different species. And so clearly, when you see this hybrid, and you think, okay, what can we do with this hybrid? Well, there isn't much you can do because you can't perpetuate this hybrid because the chromosomes cannot pair. Remember, chromosome pairing is one of the things that has to happen in meiosis. These can't pair, so how you can ever, how could you ever get to the next generation? And the answer is, well, really, you can't. This is not something that's easily reproducible. But if we have non-disjunction now, this is a mitotic error in this case, not in meiosis, but in mitosis, where somehow these spindle fibers don't work at all. And it turns out in plants, hormones, plant hormones are very important and very finicky. And so if the hormones aren't right and they don't shore up these important features such as spindle fibers, then you end up with a polyploid. And so rather than having to worry about this thing over here with five chromosomes, whoops, 
five chromosomes somehow trying to pair things up because that's not going to work. Now we're going to turn it into ten chromosomes because it's an error and of course ten is a number divisible by two. So that means somehow they paired up. You now have a diploid set again and that can then work. So now meiosis here cannot work. Here it can. So that's good. That's part one. Oops, meiosis. Check. But if you're the only one in town with 10 chromosomes and nobody else is around, well, that means you, you don't have a partner. Ah, shucks. All of this for nothing. So that means you don't have a partner in reproduction. And you would be reproductively isolated, and that's the end of it. Except if you can self-fertilize. Self-fertilization is, of course, something we already encountered in plants, didn't we? One of the things that happened with Mendel's peas is that they would normally self-fertilize. And if you can self-fertilize, then you can create your own species. And that's basically how this works. And so if you look at these evening primroses, and you look at them in all their glory, and they're reproducing, and you help them do this because it's your experiment. Well, sometimes, some of them make this error. And within your nice experimental garden, you suddenly have this new thing. And there it is. And you try to figure out where did that come from. Well, it came from an accumulation of errors. First, an error in reproduction. Then, an error in mitosis then self-fertilization. And you'd think, well, this is pretty complex. How often does this happen? Well, it turns out it happens with some frequency. It doesn't happen all the time, but periodically you see these kind of things, and they do produce fertile hybrids. Now, it turns out things like this also happen in some salamanders and some frogs. So you, for example, you have... Uh, great tree frogs in uh, the, the, the east, and there's two types. One that's the normal diploid one, and one that is tetraploid. It has twice the number of chromosomes. They look pretty much the same. They're both great tree frogs, but they don't sound the same. They don't reproduce with each other, and it happens periodically. Salamanders are another example. There's, there's different kinds of frogs in, in Africa. The little clawed frogs that some people have in their aquarium, those also can go through this process. And so you have all these weird species that literally arise from one generation to the next. And this is no more felt more prominently, it turns out, than in the ancestry of bread wheat. Now, of course, we all know bread wheat because that's what we probably eat on a daily basis. But you didn't know that it was something that came from St. Patrick's speciation. Now, what is the story with bread wheat? I mean, why do we have bread wheat that is a weird hybrid polyploid? Well, think about the history of it. This is your history lesson for the day. You start out with a hunter-gatherer society. That's how humans began, right? We all know this. And they moved out of Africa at some point in the last, oh, maybe 60,000 years or so ago. And the hunter says, you know, I'm tired of always gathering. I'd rather just, you know, make sure that the animals come to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect some of the food for the animals that I'm hunting. I'm going to put a feeding station out there and the animals are going to be attracted to all that food I can put out there and you know it's the same kind of thing that hunters still do you find a place and you put your salt lake or whatever it is and that attracts the animals and then you can go and shoot them well this is the same kind of thing rather than always trying to go and figure out where the animals are you bring the animals to you so some of those kernels that you put out there as food for those animals are going to start growing. So even though you might just want to attract wildlife, somebody in the family says, hey, this stuff actually grows. Why don't we grow some more at home so we don't have to go and find it all the time? And so therefore, 
you now have something that's useful for two reasons. One, it attracts the wildlife you want to shoot and eat. Two, it brings you some grain closer to the house that you don't have to go out and forage for all the time. This is now called cultivation. And that's literally how agriculture began. People started to cultivate some of the things they found in the grasslands. They picked the ones that they liked the best because they had the best tasting grains or they produced the most, uh, the, the largest grains so that you can extract flour from them and so on. So there's a little bit of artificial selection in this process. And those grains, as you put them out into your field, they actually hybridize in the field. And because of the kind of plant grasses are, they can self-fertilize. And so when you look at domesticated plants in general, you find that there are many of them that are polyploids and that are based on known patterns of ancestral breeding based on the similar principle. Now, how did it go specifically with our bread wheat? Well, of course, you start with bread wheat and, you know, that's what we know today and so you can figure out the chromosomes of what that has. And then you go and call your archaeologist buddies and say, hey, did you guys ever find some early grains in some of the things you excavated? And they said, sure, but here you go. And I have some wild einkorn for you and some goat grass. This is stuff that they found in some of the oldest settlements. Literally, yesterday's garbage, right? That's what we talked about. And so way back when, they had these kind of things in, in their, uh, their seed collection, in, in really old pots, clay pots. And wild einkorn is still something that you find now in the Middle East, Mesopotamia. Goat grass is as well. And if you look at their chromosomes, both of these have 2n equals 14 as a diploid number. And so if you look at an, a wild einkorn, let's call that genome A. So here's genome A and the goat grass has genome B, then what you can do is you can hybridize them, and of course that makes you AB, right? Now the AB is sterile. Why is it sterile? It's because there is some problem with the way these chromosomes interact, and so all by itself this wouldn't work. But if you then have self-fertilization and the cell division error, now you're going to end up with something that does work and that's two of each. So this is now a 4n species, right? It gets 2n from this one, two of the a's, and two of the b's. So you have a, a, and b, b both contributing. Now it turns out, just as with Hugo de Vries, you find that the plants are slightly bigger, the kernels are slightly bigger, the hairs are slightly longer, everything's kind of a little bit more. And that stuff is now called emmer wheat. And it is something that was used widely in the Middle East before we had the current kind of wheat. And then also, lastly, you have jointed goat grass. And the jointed goat grass is another diploid. 2n equals 14 and 4n equals 28. Put those together. And now you end up with sterile hybrid that has an error and self-fertilizes, and that's how you end up with bread wheat. Bread wheat, 6n equals 42. So you have something called a hexaploid. Hexa is 6 in Greek. So you have 6 times 7. Right? This is 2n, so n is 14, uh, is, n is 7, and 6 times 7 is 42. And that's the ancestry of bread wheat. Now, people figured this out. They didn't know it. We had bread wheat. But then we found all this other stuff and tried to figure out what other people were eating. And that's how you end up with this. So in the place where we literally had the cradle of agriculture, Mesopotamia, today's Iraq, that's where you find wild einkorn and, and goat grass. And that's why during the process of establishing agriculture people 
started to end up with sympatric species that made up that made for better better bred wheat. There you go. And that's as far as we're going to take it today. <laughs>